I always feel like I'm going against the flow when, when I come back up and they're all heading out the back. It's great. It's great. Well, welcome everyone. Glad you're here this morning. Welcome to Linda Alliance. I extend my welcome to you as well. My name is Pastor Bruce. You're one of the pastors here as well and we're glad to have you here this morning. It's great. We, uh, many of you I haven't seen, how did somebody put it to me the other day? I haven't seen you since the last decade. So, uh, I was kind of, I thought, yeah, I guess that's true. It has been a new decade, so good to have you here. Years ago, probably decades ago now, um, my daughter, uh, was, when she was small, she would come up to me and she would want to talk to me. And of course, and we'll talk about, how, you know, all of us are busy and so I'm always busy and always doing things. And so I, she'd be chattering away at me and I'm going, yeah, 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 yeah. And she'd go, Daddy, you're not listening. Oh, yes, I'm listening. No, no, you're not listening. And then she would, then she would crawl up in my lap and she'd get a hold of my face and she would go like this. And then she would go and start talking to me and saying, hey, I, I, I need to talk to you. And then she would proceed to tell me what she wanted me to, to listen. And she was serious. I mean, she sensed... I wasn't listening, and in probability, I wasn't probably totally listening as much as she would have liked. When it comes to our relationship with God, there's, that's often the problem too, but it's not the kind of problem you think it is. It's not where we got to crawl up into God's lap and get a hold of God's face and saying, God, I want to talk to you. No, God is listening. God hears. It's more like God has to crawl into our lap and say to us, Bruce, I want to talk to you. I want to spend time with you. I want to engage you in conversation. And God will often do that. He will try to deliberately get our attention by doing all kinds of things to grab a hold of our attention so that we will look at him and spend time with him and listen to him. Why? Because he loves us. He sees us. He knows where we are. But we get so distracted by so many different things that God says, no, Bruce, I, 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 need, I need you to come aside. I need you to pull aside with me and spend time with me because I love you. You see, there's, there's lots of distractions in our world. There's uh, time, there's energy, there's just a thousand distractions. Probably more distractions now than ever before in all of history. But it only takes two or three, doesn't it? It only takes two or three to distract us. It doesn't take a thousand, though there are a thousand out there. It only takes two or three to distract us. And on top of that, there's another component that we often misplace here in North America. And that is that we are in a spiritual war. There's a warfare going on around us. I'm not talking about, you know, the kind of war that we're seeing that's happening in our world between you know, the U.S. And, Ir and Iran or North Korea or, you know, some of the other, the, the fighting and the animosities that's going on there. I'm talking about a spiritual world. You see, the spiritual world is more real than the world that we, you can see and touch and feel. Did you know that? It's more real, but we don't believe it in North America. Oftentimes we don't believe it. Let's put it that way. Until you actually see it demonstrated. Until we've actually seen it face to face. Until we see somebody who is under the influence of the enemy and, and they are literally in bondage to the enemy of their soul. And I've seen that a number of times. Um, I've heard it. I've heard people shout out and cry out that I would have never thought could have put that kind of sound could have come out of their, their lives, their bodies. And so the spiritual world is real. Paul says this in Ephesians. He says, we're at war. He says, for though we live in the, in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought in order to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. You see, Paul says we are in a spiritual world. There is a spiritual dynamics going around us, and we just going, ah, oh, well, you know, it's just, I just got to get, 
I gotta pull up my socks, I gotta do better, I gotta whatever. And we wait a second here, is it, is it me or is there someone else influencing me from the outside? But let's look at, let's look at what Paul says in these, in, these, in these few verses here. First of all, he says we're, we're at war. We are at war. There is a spiritual world out there. Oftentimes we don't fully comprehend it. There are angels and there are demons. And we all love angels. Don't we love angels? Um, you know, if, how many of you have ever seen an angel? Any of you? A few of you have? Um, I've seen one once. Vange and I saw it together. Or two angels, actually. It was in a hospital. We didn't know they were angels to afterwards, just due to circumstances. That's another whole story. Some of you have heard it. But we, but it was, we didn't even realize they were angels till afterwards. Angels unawares. Though they're real. They were ministering to a guy who had zero family. Zero. Trust me, we looked. The RCMP looked to find this guy's background. There was nobody. There was nobody. But he was a child of God, and these, these two angels were ministering to him. You see, that's how real they are. They are real. There's also demons. Now, we go, yeah, well, you know, yeah, there's, you know, I, I can think of a few times when, you know, I walked by that cemetery, and, you know, at night, and it was all, Ooh, you know, and, and especially as a kid, boy, your hair stands up on the back of your neck, and, you know, you hear creaking in the trees, and all this kind of stuff, and you think, oh, yeah, there's, there's, or you, that old creepy house, right? You can probably think of that old creepy house, and you're going, oh, I'm not going there, especially at nighttime. And we think that's, we, we think of those instances where the demons are. And yet, you know what? The demons are more around us than we know, just as the angels are more around us than we realize. And there's places in the world that take the whole angels and demons seriously. It's not that we need to, to, to fear them. We don't need to, we have to respect them because of the authority they have and the rights they have in our world. But we don't have to, we don't have to, we don't kind of minimize them or pretend they don't exist. We have to recognize that there's a, there is a spiritual war going on around us. And Paul says here that the weapons we use in that spiritual war are different than the weapons we fight with in the normal everyday fight that we think about. When you have a fight with your spouse or with your kids, the weapons you use there are different than the weapons God says we should use in the spiritual world. Do you think about that? Maybe there's sometimes we should use the weapons we use with God. We should use that with our kids and with our, our spouses and with the people that we have disagreements on. But he says they're different. They're not things like power and control and yelling and screaming and dominance and all that kind of stuff. No, no, Paul says, wait a second, that, that's not, those aren't the weapons that we use. We have far different weapons that are far more powerful. Have far more reaching ability and strength than those things of control and dominance. And so, before we go any farther, I want to just take a, I want to stop right there, knowing that we are fighting a spiritual war. And I just want to pray for us. I just want to pray for us right now. Jesus, we thank you that you have conquered all and that all authority and a power has been placed underneath, underneath you. And you have given that now to us. And we recognize that we are in a spiritual war. That there's fighting and arguments and stuff going on around us that we don't see. And God, the enemy of our soul will want to blind us to the truth and the reality of who you are and the weapons that you have given to us. And so now, in Jesus' name, we take authority in, through the blood of Christ and we bind the enemy to silence and we invite you, even as Kevin prayed at the beginning, Holy Spirit, come and speak. Speak loudly into our hearts and our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So what are, what are the weapons that we fight with? What are they? Have you ever thought about what they are? Well, Ephesians chapter 6 puts it this way. And there's a picture going to come up on the screen. And uh, it's kind of got a reminder. You know, now just listen to these verses and look at the picture. Okay? Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Notice that guy's got a suit on in there. So he's just an everyday guy. So it's just an everyday kind of person. 
Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The devil's got schemes. He's got plans for your life. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, he says, because all that's going on, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. There's, there's going to be some wrestling going on there. There's, there's a dynamic that's going on there. And he, therefore he says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take the, sh the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. There's, there's our weapons, defensive weapons, offensive weapons, but there's more than just those. Let's go through them really quickly. There he talks about the helmet of salvation. Do we have that? Do you know Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ, what he has done for you? In a little while, Alan's going to lead us in communion, and that's what communion is all about, is about what Jesus has done for us. Do we have that? Do we have ourselves covered with righteousness? Well, you might say, well, you know, yeah, I got Jesus' righteousness, and, you know, sometimes I choose righteous things, and sometimes I don't, and I know I should, but, well, when we don't, we open, our, we open ourselves up to attack. It's, it's, it's not that we're not going to heaven or anything like that. It just means that we've opened up a part of our, of our life for the enemy to access our lives. The belt of truth. You're going, well, yeah. Sometimes I live in, you know, sometimes I live in truth. And sometimes, well, you know, I kind of feel like I was reading this morning in, in Genesis. And poor old Sarah, she got caught lying. You know, they, the angels, she laughed when she shouldn't have. And then she said, well, I didn't laugh. And the angel said, yeah, you did. She was, she was afraid. Sometimes we get caught in that. But he says we need the belt of truth. And the feet with the gospel of peace. Living in peace and contentment. Contentment. That's a really big stretch. Or the sword of the spirit. The word of God. And you're going, yeah. I don't pick it up as much as I should. I kind of leave it there. Or leave it in my pocket, you know, in case you read it on your phone or whatever. And you're going, yeah, I don't, I don't use that sword I just, I'm busy, right? Or the shield of faith. There's other, there's other weapons we can use too that aren't listed here that I think are, are weapons, that, things like love. And we've talked lots about the weapons and the power there is in love. Another one is humility. And we're going to talk about that next week. And it's kind of linked to righteousness and truth. But it's a weapon that we can have. What if... We used humility. But Paul says in here, and I didn't read those verses, but Paul says you have to put all the armor on. How? With prayer. To pray. Pray in the Spirit on all circumstances. Like God says that that's how we do this. Well, how do, you, how do you spend time with prayer? Because it's like, oh, look, there's, there's, some, there's some deer out there. Or, oh, I didn't know so-and-so drove that vehicle. Right? Don't you get that way? You start praying and all of a sudden you're distracted and you're going, oh, there's three things I forgot. I was stand, sitting here this morning in worship and I thought, I forgot to send out an email. Oh, distractions. They're everywhere. In the middle of worship, in the middle of prayer, no matter what we're doing, the distractions are there. How do we, how do we focus ourselves more than we, than we already are when there's so many things that are calling our attention all over the place? The one, I don't know if you call it a weapon or it's a part of the whole weapon of, of prayer, and that is this thing called fasting. Now, fasting is not a thing we often talk lots about in our world. We talk lots about dieting, but that's not really having to do with the spiritual, it has more to do with the physical. And we're going, yeah, you know, and sometimes we, we confuse the two. We're going, 
we were having a conversation with some people this last week about this whole thing of fasting, and they're going, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to fast, but I'm thinking I probably will use, lose like 10 or 20 pounds, you know, through the fast and all this kind of stuff. And I'm going, you know, Vance and I were talking, wait a second here, what does that ha dieting or losing weight have to do with fasting? It might be a benefit, but that's not what fasting is all about. What is fasting? Fasting is one way that it's, it's cutting through, it's, it's surrendering something that is very dear to us. And it's usually food, but it might not be, and we'll talk about some other things that we could surrender. That we give, it, we give up as a way of realigning our body and our soul and, in a, and bringing it under authority of our renewed spirit. It deals with cravings. And not allowing those cravings to control us. You see, when we become a follower of Jesus, we submit our spirit to the, our spirit to the Holy Spirit who renews our spirit. And fasting brings our soul and body underneath the authority of our renewed spirit. One person describes it this way. He says, um, when we're, we're, before we become a follower of Jesus, our soul... Without the, without the renewed spirit is like a three-year-old child. Now, picture the worst three-year-old child you know. Probably won't take a lot of thinking and imagination, right? Grandkids, maybe your own kids, maybe a niece or nephew, maybe a sibling, whatever. Maybe you have some siblings that are still three-year-olds. I don't know. But anyways, think of a three-year-old, the way they whine and cry and they complain. And you wake up in the morning, you're that three-year-old. You wake up in the morning and your soul asks your emotions, how do you feel? And you're going, I feel terrible. And so for the remainder of the day, how do you think you're going to feel? Terrible. You're going to be grumpy, you're going to be whining, you're going to be complaining, you're going to be depressed, you're going to be argue argumentative, you're going to be demanding. And so... Your life for that day is like a three-year-old running around the house. Guess how everybody else then views you? Like a three-year-old. <laughs> Do they want to be around you? No. Not if they can help it. Not if they can help it. Then one day you surrender your life to Jesus. And he begins to change you. Your spirit becomes alive. Your spirit now wants to rule through your... The Holy Spirit now has renewed your spirit and your spirit now is alive and it's new. It's different than it was before. But have you ever tried to take control back from a, from a 10-year-old who's been living as a 3-year-old for 7 years? Imagine what happens. It's awful. It's almost next to impossible. The whining, the demanding only increases. So what do parents do? The parent must win the battle. Right? Parents? You got, or grandparents, whatever. You got to win the battle. And so the parents fold their arms and they're going to go, we're going to outlast the three-year-old. Right? We're going to outlast. And so the whining and screaming and complaining and th throwing on the ground and, oh, and complaining and I want this or that. And the parent just very calmly stands there and says, no. That's not the way it's going to be. And now with persistence, the 10-year-old who's been living as a 3-year-old for 7 years finally realizes that mom and dad are really persistent in this and that the best way is to listen to mom and dad, the, the wisdom of mom and dad. And then as they begin to do that, peace returns to the home. You see, that's how our lives are often. Our, our, our soul, our body has these cravings. These demands, and it tells our spirit what should do what it should do. And fasting is one way in which we can force our body, physically body, our bo physical body, to realign itself and saying, "Yeah, you're going to be hungry. Guess what? Suck it up. You're going to miss a meal or a whole day worth of eating." But it's more important for me to surrender myself because I'm going to use that time to focus on God. Now, the enemy of your soul won't like it either because he's, 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 he's the worst three-year-old there is. He just adds to the fire. 
But that's what, in a sense, what fasting is. It's realigning your body and your emotions and trying to do something physically against what your body is a normal habit of doing and realigning it underneath your spirit and saying, I choose to not eat for this day. Now, we'll talk more about fasting, what types of fasting there are in a few minutes, but, but that's, that's what it is. And the, 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 the spirit must not give in to the whims of the soul and of the body, the cravings of the soul and the body. And that's really what fasting is all about. It's a realigning, it's regaining, allowing the spirit to regain control in our lives. And after a period of time, after practice and persistence on it, guess what happens? It's just like any three-year-old. Once there's persistence and the parents are consistent at it, guess what happens? There's a lot of peace in the house. When you say, hey, put the toys away. Put the toys away. Okay. Away they go and they put the toys away. But initially, trust me, that same daughter who wanted my attention, I can remember one instance, we went head to head. She's a strong, strong woman. I'm glad she's strong. But as a three-year-old, it was tough. It was tough. But persistence pays off. And the more we align our spirit and the more we bring our body and our emotions under the alignment, underneath the, the control of our spirit, the renewed spirit that God has put within us, the more victory we will have. And when the real big temptation comes along, the spirit wins. The spirit wins. It's one of the key purposes of fasting. It strengthens our spirit so they don't give up, they don't give in to the soul cravings. There's a lot of people that have sins, that besetting sins, sins that keep coming back, and things that just need habits, they just can't seem to break. Sometimes fasting is one way that you can do that. It allows us to find time on our day because it's basically saying whatever we put aside for eating, we push that aside and now we're focusing in on God. Now, if you're like me, it's hard to sit yourself down when you're fasting. Because when you're fasting, you're thinking, oh, food, 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 so I'm going to go do this rather than sit and pray. But the time that you normally would be eating is the time that you should set aside as your time to pray and to seek God's face. To realign yourself. It gives you more time to spend with him. And you know what? Initially, you're going to feel like you're pounding your head against the wall the first few times you do it. And as you get, it's like anything. It's like a three-year-old. Again, it takes time to realign and to bring it back and to to get yourself quiet enough so that you you can begin to hear God's voice and begin to trust him. I mean, I've I've told you this probably a number of times, but when I was a kid, my grandfather used to always tell me, Bruce, slow down. And I heard that voice this week again. Bruce, slow down. You're going too hard. You need to stop. You need to rest. You need to watch the sunrise. This morning I stood at the window for about 30 seconds longer than I normally stand at the window and looked at the sunrise. Because I heard that voice. But we need to take more time than that. You see, when you ask somebody, oh, how are you doing? And you're going, oh, man, I'm busy. If somebody said to you, if you ask somebody, how are you doing? And somebody said, well, you know, I'm just having the most amazing day. I'm just, it, I'm just so peaceful and restful. And, and you'd kind of look at them like, okay, so what are you on? What did you drink? Have you smoked something? You know, I mean, really, isn't that how it is? If, we, if we're not busy, there's something wrong with us. Don't you feel that way? If we're not going flat out, there's got to be something wrong with us. And people don't know what to do with us if we, if we don't, if we, if we say that we're not busy, like, um, yeah, like they're lost for words. But God calls us to rest and to be silent. But our minds are so active that we're eating, we're reading, we're perusing Facebook, we're watching a video on WhatsApp, Snapchat, Twitter, I mean, whatever, playing a game or, or just being with people. We don't know how to be still and to be silent. 
Just to sit in God's presence. I mean, Psalm 46, verse 10. He says, be still. Be still. And in the stillness, know that I am God. And in that stillness, in that knowing of God, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still. The more intimate we, with, we are with a person, the, more we can, the longer we can sit with them in silence. You ever, you ever been with somebody who's brand new? And you're going, hey, how are you doing? And then you, st you stand there and you're going, ah, oh, what do I say next? And then it's almost like you kind of leave because it's, it's awkward, right? You don't know what to say. They're not talking, you're not talking, you're just, you feel like there's got to be something going, something being said. But the longer, you, the more comfortable you are with somebody, like a husband and wife or brother and sister or brother, brother, whatever, you can sit long times with them and just be silent. You can drive all the way from here to Calgary and probably not say a word and be okay with that. But if you're with somebody you don't know, oh, that's just got to be the most awkward thing in the world, Right? You know what I'm talking about. And God says that he wants us to come into his presence and just be still and be okay with not hearing anything and, not, and be okay with not saying anything. Just being still in his presence. So as we look at seeking more of God, we need to focus our attention more on being, on being able to be still and to be silent before, before him in his presence. And one of the ways is fasting to do that. And there's lots of verses where it talks about that. Where in the book of um, Joel, Joel chapter 1 and verse 14, he says, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. So it's not just something, fasting isn't just something you do alone, just you and, you and God. You can do it that way. But it's also a, an opportunity for us as a body to gather together and to seek God together. Even in Ezra chapter 8, verse 21, there by, by the ah Ahava canal, I proclaimed a fast so that they might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for his safe journey for us and all our children with all our possessions. And then I love this one, and, and then you say, well, that's Old Testament stuff. Well, let's look at Acts chapter 13, verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, in the middle of the fasting and the worshiping, the Holy Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I had called them. They hadn't planned on sending Paul and Barnabas. They were just worshiping and seeking God as a, as a church in Antioch. And in the midst of that, God says, I gotta, here's my strategy. Here's what I want you to do to reach the world or reach this part of Europe. You see, God calls us to stretch ourselves, to seek him. He calls us to fasting. Now, I don't know how many of you got the cards, but um, if you were here on uh, New Year's Eve, you would have got one of these. They're on the stand there, so I don't know if there's some guys that are close to the stands there, if you could grab them and pass them out to everybody who didn't get one. Um, somebody on this side, or a couple of people on this side, just maybe Bob, if you could grab them there on the stand. Make sure you get one of these, because these are, these are kind of what we want to talk about a bit about this morning. On this card, there's two sides to it. On the one side that's got the big thing, it says prayer and fasting. On there is the corporate uh, four requests that, that the elders board would like you to pray for for this next year. If you were here New Year's Eve, we, we prayed through this card. And it's a great opportunity to, to, to look at them. And I'm, so I'm just going to quickly read them here. The first one is that Linden Alliance Church corporate sense of dependency upon God would grow as we understand more clearly the vision he is calling us to. And we looked at Hab Habakkuk 3.2 in regard to that. We want to be more dependent upon God. Number two, for God to allow us to open doors for outreach to youth, neighbors, and families, that God would increase those opportunities to see his kingdom grow. That's what we're praying for. We're wanting to say, God, we want to, we want to help more people. Number three, that as he grows our church, that our finances would meet the increased needs so we can carry out all that he's calling us to do. We've got some more things that we'd like to do, but that only require, they can only do that if we, if, if we got the finances to do it. And lastly, it's not for us, but it's for local co-op. 
that as a, te- as, as a team they have grown and we're asking God to bring greater clarity to their vision and ministry opportunities as well as financial needs to support their team and ministry. Those are four things that we are asking you to pray for in this next year. And so next year in our AGM, our annual, which will be like 2021, we're going to report on these four things and how we've seen those things, how God answers those four requests. Now they're pretty broad, but hey, we're leaving it wide open that God can do, if God wants to do more than these four, hey, how many of you are ready for that? I'm, I'm ready for that. Okay, and I think he might. I think he will. Now on the back side, there's, um, there's some things, there's, what you're saying, okay, so what, what are we doing here? Over the next couple of weeks, we're, we're doing this Sunday, next Sunday, and the following Sunday, we're three messages on prayer, different aspects of prayer. What if, they're called. And this Sunday is what if we chose to fast along with our prayer. So starting on uh, January 12th to the 19th, we're going to have um, a time of prayer and fasting that week. Not saying, and we'll talk a bit more of that in a minute. But that's a week we're going to set aside. There's some opportunities set aside there for prayer. That we invite you to corporate prayer, prayer events. Look at that. There's some on Tuesday, some on Wednesday. And then we also encourage you to set 30 minutes aside at least four days four times in that week of January 12th to the 19th, an extra 30 minutes just to spend time with God. Okay, that's all we're asking. We're just baby steps here. We're not asking you to set three hours or an all-night prayer meeting or anything like that, just 30 minutes, okay? And, and then fast, um, I will fast Wednesday all day, January 15th, and then fasting type. Now, this is where we're going to talk a bit about what kind of fasting types there are. There's different kinds of fasts. You see... Oftentimes we think of fasting as no food and water. There's, there's complete fast, which is no food and water, but that's unusual, and that has to be a God-orchestrated thing. that We don't call people to do that. But fasting, a, a normal fast is no food for, say, 24 hours and just drinking water. Um, some people say, can I have coffee? Can I have, you know, th- this? Or, you know, yeah, you can, whatever you decide to do. It's, it's your, you and God orchestrating the fast. There's also other kinds of fasts. There's partial fasts where you might do, say, you might eat fruit and vegetables, like a Daniel fast, whole foods or something like that, or, and water. And in, instead of, you know, cut out the carbohydrates, some other kinds of fasts might be, you're going to say, I'm going to cut out all sugars. So things like chocolate and, uh, you know, um, other kinds of breads and all those kinds of things, you decide, no, I'm going to cut that stuff all out. I can eat, you know, fruits and vegetables and meat kind of thing or whatever. So the fasting can take on different aspects. Or it might be just saying, just, just sugars. Like you're just going to cut out all candy because candy is an addiction. And uh, you want to say no to candy for a day or maybe a week. Um, it could also be a media fast. You see... Because we're so busy in our world, people are always, you know, you, you, you go out and you, you're standing in line somewhere and people are look, they're standing in line and they're looking like this and, you know, the way they go, they're scrolling through and then they're, oh, oh yeah, okay. And they're moving forward. Or, you know, they go to the bathroom, pull out the phone. Or, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You're even, at, even at sitting down with your spouse at mealtime. You go to a restaurant. How many times have you done that? We were taking notice of this at Christmas time with our own kids and even myself. I was noticing, how many times do I pull out my phone? I'm going, you know, we're sitting around the living room visiting and all of a sudden I pull out the phone and I'm going, wait a second, what am I doing? So there's a craving there, an emotional craving or a, a busyness craving, whatever it is. So maybe you need to say, okay, only for phone and text messages only, that's it. Or emails, if you use your phone for emails, nothing else. I know some of you already... <laughs> do that because you're not addicted to the crack book and all the rest of those kinds of things but but you know there is addictions we have addictions so maybe a media fast is what God's calling you to do maybe there's something else that you I mean the Bible only talks about kind of two types of fasting one is it talks about food fasting and the other was the one that between a husband and wife that you should set aside your intimate relationships for a period of time so you can pray and fast. That's the only two fastings that are actually described in the Bible. But I think there's a lot more because both of those are cravings, physical cravings that we have. 
that's, I think we could add a media craving as well, especially in our day. There may be other things that you need to, to do. Maybe it's you have a craving to be socially engaged with people all the time. And you can't just be by yourself, you and God. Maybe you need to pull aside from that and just be you and God alone. Maybe that's the best thing for you. Maybe, maybe you need to go spend time with people because you're too much alone. I don't know. But anyways, so ask God, God, what kind of fasting are you calling me to do? And can I choose that for at least one day or part of a day even? Maybe it's one meal. Start small. Don't, don't, don't try and run a marathon when you've got to run around the block first or walk around the block first. Go slow. And then say, okay, put on there what you were going to fast for and, when, and how, what kind of fast that is and so on. And then lastly at the bottom there is spend some time either this week leading up to that week or even at the beginning of that week starting next Sunday, is spend some time saying, okay, God, what are two or three goals that I want to ask you for? Not, not things that you, that you want to ask for, but things that, that God is saying, God's putting on your heart to ask him for, that he's going to answer. Because we could say, well, you know, I could really use a million dollars, and we could all use a million dollars, but that's not probably on God's heart to give you a million dollars, so let's not ask for that. But let's find out, saying, God, let's listen. Spend time listening, saying, God, what do you want to do for me? How do you want to answer my prayers? How do you want to speak to me? What are you saying you want me to do? So on New Year's Eve, I wrote down three things on my card. And, um, and I'm going to pray it through. And actually, I don't even know, and I was wrestling with this, because as I was in preparation for today, I thought, well, what am I going to do for fasting? And I go, I don't know. And I started freaking out because I thought, I'm asking, inviting these people to fast, and I don't even know what fasting I'm going to do yet. So I'm in the same boat with you. And God said, that's a good thing to be. Because now everybody else feels on the same level. You haven't got it all figured out. Okay? So, over the next week, you've got a week to kind of pray and ask God, what kind of fasting do you want me to do? How much? How long? What type of fast? All that kind of stuff. Don't bite off more than you think you can chew. And then commit yourself to that. God has great things in store for us when we seek him. And as I said, this series we've called it, What If? What if we sought God more intensely with things like fasting? if we really sought him in ways that we've never done before, that we've, we've checked some of those cravings that we have, some of those whiny three-year-old emotions that, so, that we would never admit to anybody else, but that we have them, we all have them, that rule our lives more than we'd like. Can we bring those up underneath the authority of Jesus underneath the, the, the renewed spirit that he's given us. Can we do that? God's saying to you, I want to talk to you. I want to see your face. I want to draw close to you in ways that you have not known before. Will you look at me? Will you sit and be still and know that I am God? Lord, we don't have to twist your arm. You love us. You love everybody sitting here, no matter what we've done. Some of us have done some pretty stupid things in our lifetime, but you love us just the same. We're so glad that we're all on equal footing before your throne. And it's not our righteousness, it's not all the things that we do that makes us good before you, it's the righteousness of Jesus. You call us to make right steps, to align our daily living with the righteousness you've placed within us. We're so grateful for that. And so God, today, I pray that as we come to you, God, you would turn our face to see you and to seek you in ways that we have never, ever sought you before, that we would hear your voice, that we would align our soul and our body as rebellious and as 
three-year-oldish as it has been, that we would say no to it and bring it underneath the authority and, and of, of, of our spirit, our renewed spirit, who has been renewed by you, ultimately underneath you, Holy Spirit. So lead us and guide us as we seek you. Lord, this is, this is an amazing opportunity to, to, as a body to seek you and to see you work in our lives. So we surrender ourselves to you as a church. We look forward to what you will do. And we ask that you would teach us and guide us. Lord, as, as we gather around the table, God, that's all about you. Kevin said that earlier. It's all about you, Jesus. This fasting and praying is all about you. Communion's all about you. Lord, lead us into that as Alan comes now and leads us, we pray in Jesus' name.